Well, we are finishing up chapter 17, and this particular section is dealing with the Lord's return. Pharisees asking a question regarding that. Do you have notes available and use them on the screen? But today is also the third Sunday of January, which is the uh, Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, which I did want to also acknowledge and recognize. <clears throat> it seems to me, wherever I look in the scriptures, there's a, an interesting contrast that's always portrayed. On the one hand, We just don't get it. We see things, we evaluate them, we see their natural goings and comings and have substantial confidence with, with, with respects to what we think we see and we really don't recognize that we don't see anything like we ought to see them. And on the other side, there's that which is invisible, which really requires the eyes of faith to see, and that's the challenge of our Christian life. So no matter what kind of situation you and I are faced with, the battle really lies in how are you going to look at it? Are you going to look at it in the natural, or are you going to look at it by the grace of God in the supernatural? So my title this morning on the screen is the image, likeness, and appearing of God. And I've, I've added the image and the likeness part as just sort of a contextual reality to the fact that um, we don't see things like we ought, and yet God intends himself to be seen by that which he has created. So the subtitle, The Conflict in, in Human Perception. Now, you might wonder, how am I going to tie this passage of the Lord's return and the timing of the Lord's return? How am I going to tie that in with the sanctity of human life Sunday? And um, I'm forcing it a little bit, I acknowledge, to make it happen. But as I was thinking about these particular things, I recognize that uh, abortion is the consequence, really it's the, ulter, the ultimate consequence of man trying to give value to life according to his perception, according to his outlook, according to his understanding. And failing to have that capacity to do that, he devalues life. And so on the screen is a, are a few verses somewhat familiar to you, I am sure. From Genesis 1, 26 and 27, at the creation of man, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So my, my title this morning, image, likeness, and appearing of God. So the image of, and the likeness of God, and we're going to be focused on this passage is on the image of God, and let them have dominion of the sea, the fowl of the air, the cattle upon the earth, and every creeping thing that crawls on the earth. And so God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So we see this picture of God's image, and as we're looking at that picture, there's a little element added just for perception. And this is a huge, this introduces the huge conflict of decision making. And he said, let them have dominion over the fish, sea, fowl, cattle, creeping things on the earth. Now, murder was always understood to be forbidden. As we, if we continued reading Genesis, we would read of the sad story of the first murder in human history, Cain killing his brother Abel, and God dealing with that 
in a significant way. But in Genesis 9, Noah gets off the boat. Noah, Noah gets off the ark. And God has a significant statement that he says here. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Now, to me, that's the most profound verse in the, in the whole Bible about the mystery of the value of human life. And God has essentially restrained man from taking authority over human life, over its existence. When it begins and when it ends, that's not in man's authority. Now, when we see things from God's perspective, this is what God wants us to recognize. I don't have the capacity to value human life like God does. And in fact, I can torment myself in a huge way if, if I lean upon my own understanding in trying to value human life. We, we value things by what we see and feel, and so we're going to call someone great who does great things by our definition of great. And we're going to call somebody meaningless who has no capacity to do anything great whatsoever. And it's so incredibly important for us to understand that the very first step of honoring human life is respecting how God made human life. And so we, we have this difficult little bridge. We're in the image of God and his likeness. And so we're given authority. We have dominion. That word there for dominion is, is an authoritative word. I have the right to raise cattle and to do to them as I see fit according to my understanding, according to my sense of interest on the earth, within the bounds of understanding which the law clearly helps us understand. But I don't have that authority with my fellow man. And I, and I have to recognize that great divide. And it's, it's where you let off of imposing your perspective. That, that's the doorway when you begin to let in God's outlook, God's perspective, what's going on. Now, <clears throat> the um, next verse is a little more difficult. I, I, re, I removed the little Hebrew label so you can't see it as quickly. See, see if you can guess which one it is, though. Talking about image. Surely every man walks in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heaps up riches and knows not who shall gather them. Now the word for image, the Hebrew word for image that's translated most everywhere else as image, is that word show. In a vain image, a vain show. So we have this huge need. Man has a huge need. And every one of us in this room suffer from this particular problem. We walk around in a vain show. <clears throat> the wrong kind of things impress us and the wrong kind of things get us uncomfortable. And then he adds this little snapshot. We heap up riches. <laughs> then we're going to leave them and we don't even know who we're going to leave them to, who's going to gather them. So there's a huge, huge tension. And what I am trying to say as an introductory comment on this uh, Sunday, which we remember the sanctity of human life, I'm trying to say simply this, that <clears throat> the exercising of the sanctity of human life is a, an exercise that you and I can practice every day in every way. And it's an exercise by, with, with we, by, by which we refrain from imposing our sense of 
value, our sense of perspective, this, this vain show, this <clears throat> perspective of what's good and right in my own eyes. And for us to walk in true respect for the sanctity of human life is to recognize, wait a minute, I can't value life based upon that outward appearance. Now I'm going to tell you the truth, and I don't have a picture here to show you, but if I put on the screen this picture of a grand family, and in their grandeur you see them working together, playing together, well clothed, well taken care of, you know, not, not even egotistical or anything vain like that, just really looking great you would feel good and say, yeah, that's a great family, that's a good family. But if I put up on the same, or next to it, a family living in squalor with dirty faces, poor clothes, perhaps even gaunt faces, we would, we would have a tendency to imagine that that family was of less value than the family that was looking great. It would just be instant. And I'm going to tell you a horrible, a horrible truth. And as I tell it, I confess my own vanity, my own sin in the process of, of telling this. But <clears throat> we, we had to make a decision about canceling or not canceling our meeting yesterday, which we canceled. So I spent a pretty good amount of time at, on Nana's TV trying to look at weather. and could only really get the local weather reports on the news channel, so I had to watch some news. So, you know, I'm looking for the weather and this, this news item comes on about this family in Baltimore, six children were burned to death in a fire. And um, there was nine children, the mom escaped, three children escaped, the dad happened to be working overnight. And, and I have two confessions to make about me watching that. I'm watching the television to, to get the weather. So I have a very narrow interest focus. And the first channel that brought up this scene about the, they had a picture of the house that was burned and bringing up discussion on it. It was just on the screen momentarily and I turned to another channel really quick because I wanted to find the weather. And it didn't even cross my mind that I wasn't interested in somebody's tragedy, what it was. And I, I'm not sure in the few seconds that I saw it if I recognized the depth of the tragedy or not. But anyway, I just, I'm scanning, trying to get my interest taken care of. Now, do you see the picture here in verse 6? Man walks in a vain show. We have before our eyes, the word image is that what you bring to focus of what's important. And... It was really important for me to determine what the weather was going to be like, so I would know whether to cancel or hold our meeting yesterday. That was my vain show. Now, as soon as I see that kind of a horrible lack in myself, then I feel like, oh man, I don't care about anything or anybody, and I, and I start to think about it, and I realize, you know what? <clears throat> I can't fully care about things like the Lord does. But I need to walk in humility because I need to always attend to my, aver my affairs and my concerns. I must always attend to them with the respect that God himself is attending to these things perfectly. And that my, my concerns are certainly not important in the comparison of my opinion of my things to God's perspective and opinion and what he's doing. And I just want to say here at the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, we're trying to recognize, I mean, I can't fathom the millions of babies in America that have been murdered, out of sight and out of mind. And our culture, essentially, I mean, our, let's, if we just took the whole pro-life culture itself, we don't have the capacity to mourn and grieve. I mean, I did see another channel with that fire on it again, and I watched it this time, and, and I did see that it was, you know, a uh, huge tragedy, uh, and, but it was, getting, it was getting the eyes of uh, Baltimore, Baltimoreans, and yet that's 
six children, don't get me wrong, six precious children that have had the chance to be known and loved and cared for, perished, and yet there's millions and millions of children that have been murdered in our culture, and we don't have the capacity. Our vain show gives us no means whatsoever to really grasp the significance of that. <clears throat> The other thing I have to confess about that family was when I'm watching it the second time, when I'm actually watching it, um, I was wondering what the family was like. And I had this little secret prejudice that I wasn't even aware of. But I was wondering if it was a family that was carelessly living in squalor. And then, of course, then they showed pictures from Facebook and whatever, and it showed this really nice, ordinary family with all the kids and having a you know, normal, regular life. And so then you say, oh, these poor people. But I realized down deep, I'm looking, I was expecting you know, evidence of carelessness. And it's easy to have that judgmentalism in our spirit. And I just want us to understand when I start out the discussion this morning, we're made in the image of God and we have to be deliberate about glorifying God in these circumstances especially in our relationships with other human beings that is so critical for us because you and I don't have any capacity whatsoever to value another human being as they are valued before God and, and it's also maybe a little bit of a help for us to recognize um, Honestly, no, nobody's going to value you like God does. He doesn't, nobody sees the intricacies of his glory woven into the fabric of your life. Nobody sees it. Nobody's going to be able to give you that sense of value and glory. It's not going to come from man. And so be careful. Be careful of the vain show because the vain show is what? It's a trick. It's you and me trying to get our selves in a, a humanly approvable fashion. But even if we get a good pat on the back, did anybody really pat me on the back? Because of the incredible image of God that's in me that glorifies him that, that he's doing? It's easy. No, we don't. That's not how we're wired. The image of God and the likeness of God, and like I said in that first passage there, making man God's image and likeness. Likeness is a different word, and image was a little easier. Image is uh, almost like a, something that visually gives you perspective. Likeness carries with it a greater sense of similarity of sorts, and so there's a there's a comparison, and I. There's lots and lots of verses on likeness. I, I limited it very, very little down to this, this picture. Um, but again, the likeness of God, God's ruling in the affairs of the world. So when I share in that dominion, I'm, I'm like God. I have my likeness to God. I'm participating in that governance. But I'm just the sub-governor. I'm the sub-dominator. I'm doing things according to what I've been granted, according to my capacity, but God is the, is the great one with great dominion. I remember when we started killing chickens on our farm, when we started raising uh, pasture-fed poultry in large numbers, and we, um, I got photos of this over my office. So our first big butcher day, and um, I mean, it was just a little unsettling to me. We we're gonna kill all these chickens and have all this blood, et cetera. And I, I remember being overcome and I went back to this passage and I recognized that the difference between Genesis 1 and Genesis 3, excuse me, Genesis 9, is that God extended the dominion. In Genesis 1 through or one, two, nine, one through, nine, whatever. Man wasn't ever permitted to kill an animal for eat and eat it. We were all vegetarians. After the flood, 
God opened the food chain to animals because of sin. And the scripture talks about the shedding of blood has been uh, caused by man's sin. And I remember that first butcher day. I, I had to, I just gathered the kids around me. And we just prayed and worshiped God that we were going to have a chicken butchering day because man had sinned and devalued God and his purposes as we ought. And this, this um, shedding of blood was a part of the consequence of our sin. And it was a, it was a difficult thing. And, we, and, I, and I told my kids and I thought to myself when I told them, which is why I told them, you know, this is a sobering thing. We're filling our freezer and providing chickens to other people to eat. But it's because of sin that this kind of food chain has occurred. And so we eat chicken humbly because it's what came about because of our sin. Now, um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm trying to make a transition into the passage and I may have to get back to Luke um, 17 to finish it next week, I don't know, but let, let me make just a little transition here. So we see Adam living 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image. He called his name Seth. Now, here is the battle that you and I have with regards to human life. Uh, he's 130 years. We have no record of how many sons and daughters that he had actually had. There's three recorded, and this one's recorded well, well into um, the years, 130 years. And I want us to recognize that the likeness of man is dependent upon actually getting to see. You know, Seth had to be born and visually seen and we recognize here's somebody in the likeness of Adam. God was making man in the likeness of God and that was a, an imposition. So recognizing that element, there's, there's a humility. The degree that you can cherish your children is limited by what you can see. And it's controlled often and dominated by what you can see. But the actual similarity and image that your children have as reflects God, much of that is unseen. And as I intentionally move forward now to the discussion about the appearing of Christ, or appearing of God at the end of the age, I just want to add a little personal exhortation, perhaps comment to you personally, and that is differences glorify God. Differences glorify God. When men walk around in a vain show, we're focusing on similarities. And so what, what the culture agrees is proper for a vain show, everybody adheres to. But there's something that's so wonderfully unique about how God has done his work. We're made in his image, but zero, none of us reflect all of God's image. And the Lord tells us in the New Testament in Ephesians that the ultimate manifestation of God's glory is through the composite of all these manifest tokens of God's image. So the fact that if you have to be like your brother, this is an emotional struggle you're having. If you have to be like your brother, you're failing to give God glory because he's made you not like your brother on purpose. Now you know the science even identical twins aren't identical when you get right down to the biology, et cetera, no matter how similar they are. But we're all different. And God is manifest more, excuse, more of God's likeness, more of his image is manifest by our differences 
And for you and I, we're insecure being different. Now, I'm, I'm thankful that most of us have our noses on the front of our face. And if everybody had noses in random places, it would potentially be a distraction. I recognize that. But still, if you evaluate everybody's nose, there are differences. And it's intentional. It's on purpose. So you really cannot give God glory and live your life like you ought if you don't accept who you are, especially accepting your differences that make you unusual to everybody around you. Now, don't be, you know, proud and boastful about it. My nose is bigger than your nose. So I'm not talking like that. I'm just meaning celebrate, glorify God by valuing his choices in your life. And that's, that's where we begin to have a bedrock for sanctity of life. So as I kind of move on here, I'm going to close with some more thoughts potentially, but I, I, I want us to understand that um, the abortion crisis isn't because we haven't done our job to convince other people that they shouldn't do abortion. That's, that's not the crisis of abortion. The crisis of abortion is our whole culture has lost the capacity to value man as being made in God's image. And you and I, according to the word of God, we struggle with always getting it wrong. It's, it's such an easy thing to do to set the wrong standard of what's valuable. And if, and if this is what really matters in our culture, especially in our culture, what do we do with something that's different? It's trash. We throw it away. It's garbage. If something's going to interfere, we throw away the wrapping paper. And so we've, we've so lost the, the focus and the perspective of God in our own lives. And, and I just want to say, you can't value somebody else's life adequately until you valued your life as it is valued as it does reflect and glorify God. So now we're gonna move on. Oh, 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 I forgot I had another panel, okay. It's dangerous, but I'll go through it. So I, I, I wanted to read all of Isaiah 40, but I'm not gonna do that. I have some summary points on the screen and even that I'll go through quickly. <clears throat> I'm gonna read this and now as I read, I want you to think about the one thought. Have you thought about it? Do you value yourself because of who God is as you ought? The whole chapter should be read by you later, but I'll just skim through the portions here. Beginning of verse 1. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, says your God. Now, this is an incredible statement. When you value yourself as you ought before God, and when you see God as the very identifier of your whole being. You have comfort, you have value, you have meaning. That's the intention of the passage. So now we're just going to look at the things that give us comfort. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord? Or who, being his counselor, taught him? With whom did he take counsel? And who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? That's a huge meditation. And it's so simple and it's so practical. God never went to school. Everybody else has and has to. He's the, he's the founder and possessor of all knowledge and understanding. The nations. Now, when you understand it in the context of this, the whole national reality of our world functions around the vain show that men give honor to among nations. The nations are before him are as nothing. They're counted to him as less than nothing and vanity. To whom then will you liken God? Now, it's hard to think. Now, if I sat here and showed photo after photo of these great, incredible um, government pa palaces, castles, government buildings, and the intricacies of their fine of their finery. I mean, it would, it would just like, 
it would naturally Google our eyes like, wow, 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 wow. And the Lord says, that's nothing. That's less than nothing. It's just totally vanity. And the word vanity always means what? Zero, empty, without any value or purpose. To whom then will you liken God? See, what a, what a, what a challenge. <laughs> Are you going to liken God? Are you going to liken God to temporal, earthly, earthly things? So here's something that has always bugged me as a Christian. It always bugs me that so many so-called Christian, Christian-esque religions have these huge edific, edifices, as it were, temples and cathedrals and, and, and you name it. It's an incredible thing. Because why? We're always, we're always on that arc of following the glory, the vain glory of the natural. Whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare unto him? To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, says the Holy One. Now, again, I chose these words. That's the core words for the likeness. It's the same word God making, it's in a likeness. But, but who do we liken God? Do you realize that your ability to value life as God valued it only is going to be equal to the, your ability to liken God to who he is? You're not going to be able to, of your own capacity, give value to people's lives because of your largesse or wisdom. It's the value that God himself has given. And so you have to start with, who do you liken God to? There's none like me. Continuing on then, verse 17, I believe. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, that my way is hidden from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? And I just want to stop, because this is where we have a fatal blow every time in our inability to value things as God values them. <clears throat> You're in a circumstance and you have need, you have great need. And in that circumstance of your great need, you pray, you call on the Lord. And you ask God for deliverance. And you are totally blind to the fact that you are wanting deliverance in the arena of the vain show. You're wanting something that's vain to be established as if it's important and valuable and necessary. And the Lord's saying, no, 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 that's not important or necessary. I'm just going to take it away, knock it out. And so what do you do? You complain. Well, I, I used to pray, but God didn't answer my prayer. So I've given up on that one. No, you've just demonstrated that you are a man or a woman with just a vain outlook and you only measure God by what you can see in the vain world which will never be sufficient to measure God. Never, ever, ever. God wasn't there to judge right from wrong for me. <clears throat> so he continues without breath. Have you not known have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not and neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint, to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Now here's the incredible delight as we think of the sanctity of human life. <clears throat> it's impossible for you and I to live life and to value life by our own natural outlook and perceptive and understanding. The natural vein show we bring to the table isn't going to do it. Every one of us get worn out, no matter how full of strength and vigor and vigor we have. But then that wait on the Lord. <clears throat> when you enter that place where you hand over to God 
who's all knowing, who's all understanding, who never needed any instruction by anyone. <clears throat> you enter into that place and you take your circumstances that you don't understand and without demanding to understand them, you give them to the Lord. Totally, okay, Lord. My life doesn't have to make sense. And if you wish to dispose of my life in a way that according to the vain show of man looks like a total waste, and a total loss, you're God. And there's none like you. And here's the redemptive reality of the sanctity of human life. I then have my strength renewed. Oh, oh. I don't have to. I don't have to have it my way. Now, looking at the time and knowing the clarity of the moment, um, I'm going to ask your forgiveness, but as I continued on, I was going to go to Luke 17 and speak about the appearing of God because there's an exact identical parallel with respect to the Lord's return. And the Lord doesn't want us to miss his return. But I, I wanted to have a few more thoughts, so I'm going to scooch ahead and I'll go back if I can. And just, just tell you my story, you probably already know it, but tell it again. Because I went, I went to bed last night wondering, okay, well, how can I preach a message on the sanctity of human life? I, mean, I don't even get it, I don't even grasp the reality that so many millions of babies have been born. Do I grieve every time I go to sleep thinking of, those, of that loss and the devastating loss in our culture? And, you know, it's, it's beyond me. I don't have that large S. And then I remembered, first time I ever preached on a sanctity of human life that I remembered, which was uh, 1997, which this is 2017, so is that 30 years ago? 20 years ago. 20 years ago. And I preached on Psalm 139. And I, I wish I had the notes in a different order. But um, back in that passage in Isaiah, <clears throat> there's that picture of being wearied. So <clears throat> I knew that children were valuable. And by God's grace, we value children in tangible ways so that we have a big family. <clears throat> I remember getting on airplanes, traveling, and feeling like my little pro-life badge was the conversations I would have with flight attendants or the person sitting next to me. Well, how many kids do you have? Oh, let me show you my kids and take out a photo with all my kids and, and watch their devastating look of stagger. Those are all yours? One wife? <laughs> yeah. So uh, we, we, had, we had 10 children eventually, and so I preached 20 years ago on Psalm 139. Good passage. Talks about the womb and the Lord having authority and creative power in the womb. At the end of my message, I very happily announced that Sally and I are expecting our 11th child and this we're about at the 10 week mark so I was excited so my little pro-life badge was announcing our next pregnancy <clears throat> so that afternoon my, my wife started bleeding and we lost the baby now Children, I want you to really understand this. There's a difference between having an uh, intellectual understanding of the word, and there's nothing wrong with having that. It's start there, get as good a proper understanding as possible. But the word actually has power to renew, to lift your spirits on wings. And when I realized that we were losing our 11th child. The first thing I did was gallantry. Every conceivable medical intervention 
that could possibly be raised up, I was going to I was going to raise that to rescue this child. <clears throat> well, anyway, it wasn't to happen, it wasn't to be, and. <clears throat> When, when the baby was born, I was devastated because it was actually the whole placenta was delivered and as we looked at the placenta, if you've read Ecclesiastes, it talks about silver cord, before the silver cord is broken. Well, there on this placenta was a long silver cord and at the attached to the placenta, and at the other end was this embryo the size of a tomato seed. Now that's obviously a well under, underdeveloped 10 week um, child because that didn't have uh, much progress at all that you would normally have in 10 weeks. And I remember that emotion of devastation. And I, re I recognized suddenly that I, I didn't have any capacity. I had no capacity to understand and to value. And I remember telling God, this isn't fair to me. <laughs> it's always about me, isn't it? <laughs> when our vain show is what we're propping ourselves up with. I said, you know, Lord, we've, we've honored children and I, and I look at this little tomato seed on the end of a string, silver cord, little tiny, tiny hair, silver, silver hair. I said, Lord, is that really, is that really a human being? And so I, my, my whole faith was tried and my understanding was lacking and I was missing that which I needed. And so in my desperation, I went back to Psalm 139 that I had just preached that morning. And I went through the passage again, it was sort of fresh. And, and I fell upon the, my eyes fell upon the verses in the King James Version, where King David says, all, all of my members were written in your book before ever one of them was formed. And all of a sudden, my weakness and my lack and my inability to bring with power or force or vision, that was all eliminated. And I suddenly saw God for who he is. And I saw the scripture declare really simply, really plainly, this is the complete child and it's declared to be so by decree of God and it's not based upon the total of the visible that we get to see. It's based upon the decree of God who calls things that are not as though they were. That passage back in Isaiah 40, incredible transformation. I went from gut-wrenched, sucker-punched, not knowing how to function, to realizing with the deepest joy possible, we had, another child and the full purpose has been reached for that child's life and God gets all the glory and he's the one that gets all of our trust. And I tell you what, I just began to soar with eagle's wings. I mounted up and I was able to run. <laughs> and Now, when you have 10 kids and it's special to you, we always have a birthday party and a special you know, celebration of the new child. And I had there was a pattern. I couldn't resist it. So we had a party. And we were celebrating. We gave the young child a name. Now on the screen, I have a few things there that are, uh, if you look at the, I don't know if you can see it or not. Oh, wow, you can't see anything. That's horrible. Sorry about that. I have a beautiful picture on my screen. <laughs> Color. Katha Yatzer. That's what we named the small, unimaginable child, Kate the You know what Kate the means? It's from Psalm 149, and it's the transliteration of the Hebrew words. All my members were written in thy book, written members. Psalm 139. Did I say something else? 
So, verse 16 to 17. If you, at the lower right, you can't really see it because it's so bad. I, I realized, I, I want a photo, but it's, it was dark, so I had to go out and take a flash photo of the tombstone. But we bought a tombstone and engraved Cathib's name on it and the date of birth in the psalm. <clears throat> and, and I wrote a poem, and I'll, I think I'll close reading that potentially a little bit later. But we, we celebrated Cathib like we had celebrated every other child. Two things happened. The healing that I had was incredible. I had a child and I had the full emotional celebration and it was the first child I had that reached the finish line, but it was a child that I'd received by faith. And um, we did a lot of cool stuff. Granddad was still living and he and Peter handcrafted out of some really expensive wood, a little tiny coffin and we had a ceremony, a private family ceremony burying Cathab in our little rose garden. <clears throat> now when that happened though, I said a very human thing to God. That was close. I almost didn't make it. Do me a favor and never do that to me again. <laughs> that was my last prayer that I prayed <laughs> and, and I said it honestly I said you know I barely made it out of this one but I you know you know me I can't, I'm not a ritualist so I can't do the same thing twice I, I won't get the same comfort so don't try me again <laughs> so one year later same exact Sunday I'm preaching a sanctity of human life message and we were expecting, we're at the 10th week of expecting our 12th child. Now here's how strong and glorious my faith was. I didn't tell anybody. I didn't want anybody to know. So nobody knew, just Sally and I. And I preached the message, heartfelt, little fear in the background, but Sunday after church, Sally started bleeding and we lost the next one. And I'm like devastated. I said, Lord, I told you I can't do two. One's enough. <laughs> and this, again, the vain show of man leads you without strength because it leaves you without perspective and you lose your way and you grow weary and weak. One of my children, I don't remember who it was at all, one of my innocent younger children just comes marching up to me. Daddy. Are we going to have a party like we did for Cathib? We're going to name the baby Cathib? We're going to have a funeral? And that's all I needed. I suddenly realized, wow, my kids are watching. And they need to see that this is the way it is. We're going to honor life and faith on God's terms. And so we did the same thing. We made a handmade little coffin and bought a little stone and celebrated and we named this one Beth Karab. It was sort of bad use of Hebrew but uh, I wanted, Cathib sounds kind of masculine so I wanted this one to sound more feminine. We had no idea what sexes they were. <clears throat> so um, in the Bible you, you often see like Bethel, you know, the house of God. So, But I got confused so from, from Romans um, Romans 5, the word, the word God, the scripture says, the Lord calls the things that are nothing as though they were. And the word calls, so I said, well, what's the, what's the Hebrew word for call? So the Hebrew word for call is kara. So I was thinking, okay, I was thinking in, an, in understanding el kara, the Lord calls. But I took the Beth part of Bethel <laughs> because it was more feminine men said, Beth Kara. <laughs> so I changed with the house of calling. This is our house is the house of calling. But anyway, so we named her. And you know what? The incredible thing was two things were true. Sanctity of human life. We were healed. I still rejoice 
to be able to go out to our little garden and visit the tombstones. I, I pushed them over. See, I have rubbed off the leaf a little bit. <laughs> it's not perfect. These are, these, are, these are last night photos in the middle of the night. But it brought closure. But the, another thing that happened, and I just want to mention this, because I have such a big mouth, I have to tell everybody what's going on inside of my head. So I, I shared with, with other people, I shared at church, shared at homeschooling newsletter, etc. <clears throat> and in the sharing part, I was astonished because I realized one small thing, other people need that encouragement. We're, we're all struggling with the vain show. And if, we, if the only thing we ever share with our Christian friends is the vain show of the wonderful good things that happened to us and how we got a full scholarship to Yale and how we win the Super Bowl and you know yada 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 if all we do is revel in our vain show we cause so much potential confusion because those things don't really matter and so when we're able to rejoice in the thing that is so small and so invisible and others can see you know what, my, my, my wife, out of the woodwork came tons of moms who had had miscarriages. They hadn't shared with anybody. And so, practically, in closing, I want you to understand what, to me, is an intentionality. <clears throat> if you honor God, then that's what's on the table, the honor of God. And that always causes people to pause. It always gives people pause. When you're living for the glory of God and you walk through the valley of the shadow with a different perspective and people see it, it's a testimony. And it's the testimony that our world constantly needs. The world needs to see you and me Rejoicing in the invisible show of God's greatness. Especially where what the visible show is, is not a victory, but a loss. We've had two of our grandchildren reach full term only to pass away. Surrender Peace was born second, second uh, child to David Nabby and Gareth Paul was born in May of 15 to Stephen and Hannah, two full-term children. It's a little easier to mourn the loss of a full-term baby because you can actually, more people can enter into your grief because they can see the child and see the dis discouragement. But lastly, and, and, and you have this on your, the last page, and before I pray, I would just like to read these, these two things that I've written, and I'm thankful that I wrote these things. I wrote them. I, <clears throat> One is the song of motherhood. I, it's a poem I wrote. Oh, you know what? I, what? What I was hoping to read was the one about Kate, but I better turn that back on. Sorry. I want to read the poem. You, you can't see it. It's not in your notes. These two poems you can read because they are in your notes. I wrote a little poem celebrating Cathib's passing from the scriptural instruction that I had. And I'll just read it to you in closing here. I titled it Complete in Thee. And I wrote it later on in the day or a day later after his passing, complete in thee. The value of a tender life, the value of an old, are found within thy holy grasp of you, dear Lord, alone. Thy sovereign grace abounds to us in wisdom, prudence, love. Thy judgments, Lord, are very deep, conceived in heaven above. 
Can I compare my grief down here with glories yet unknown? Or can it be that you know best upon your glorious throne? My days on earth are numbered there. Thou knowest every one. Yet thou didst know them long ago, before their heir was one. So, here we gather to your wings. Yes, here we learn to trust. This is our lot of grace to win before we turn to dust. Lord, in this instant trial sore, we call upon thy name. We boldly come before thy throne, thy precious grace we claim. These needs we bring to thee, O Lord, to trust, to hope, to stay. Upon thy name and thy great power to never drift away. Complete in thee, thy perfect love, no loss of ours sustained. For no, not one can ever stay whate'er thou hast ordained. And so in courage and in hope, we trust you with our love. Though one be missing, still we are complete in thee above. And I wrote that in memory of Katha Biotzer, January 22nd, 1997. The deepest wells of comfort come from the harshest losses that we know here. But no loss is equal to his grace and to that purpose that he reserves in heaven. And next week as we get on with the message, the, the big need that we have, not only do we not value people because of their image, being in the image of God, but we value our life because it's a pathway to heaven. That's the danger, let's pray. Father, our country, many churches today are deliberately honoring the sanctity of human life. And we confess, Lord, that our human capacity to honor it is gone, is nothing. We, we don't have any, anything but a vain show. We repent and confess the great sin across our country, across our land, in our churches and in our homes, where we have so often valued life terms of the immediate vain show that we can construct or see. I pray for your people, Lord, that we might have those wings of eagles and that the despair and the sorrow, the fear of tomorrow, Lord, those things that they can all be fully put at rest in you as we, as we trust in you, knowing that you do all things well and that there's nothing of earthly loss that has any eternal value that will be missing when we live with you forever in heaven. Let us be a visible picture to the world who has no capacity to see you. We ask in Christ's name, amen.